So go ahead. What are we talking about now? We're talking about a regular hip hinge. They're as opposed to an irregular hip hinge. Yeah, well, that's what I'm getting to. Okay. Most people in fitness squat their hinge and hinge your squat. Like uh, again, I'm going to go back to the powerlifting thing. Mm -hmm. Within the rules of powerlifting, getting to mind to read is an important thing. So very often you'll see uh, a hinge oh. squat to get to ninety, uh -huh. and a squatted hinge where people will deadlift like this. I'm not going to get it. And this is not an attack on powerlifting. I want to talk about what's optimal for you guys. It's not about what's negative for somebody else. It's super helpful for them within the constraints of their sport. Right. If you're not a competitive powerlifter, don't lift like that. Right. Now, that said, every time I bring this subject up, people get in their feelings. I've been deadlifting for 20 years. Cool mm -hmm. story. Don't care. Um, feelings are great. Facts, rationale. Let's talk about it. Deadlifts and hinges often end up on back day, and people talk about oh, it's back and legs. Your paraspinals will not work well with your hamstrings. That's not a question. So if you're saying you're working back and hamstrings, your paraspinals will anteriorly tilt the pelvis. They'll bang like this, okay? Your proximal hamstrings will tuck a pelvis, they'll roll it under. So how the hell is one exercise simultaneously doing two opposite functions around the same joint? It doesn't, that's how. They're gonna get hung, they're gonna get really stuck. That's exactly it. You have opposing forces opposing each other. Yeah, so nothing would happen. So what typically happens instead is the hamstrings drop off, yeah. and people do most of the movement with some quads and calves, which can be fine, depending, but then just use a ton of lower back. Now, if you like your vertebrae where they are, <laughs> like if you have a choice, for example, between I'm gonna put five, 600 pounds of load through a hamstring on the muscles that are directly directing where my vertebrae go, it's a fairly easy choice for me. I'm not saying you will herniate a disc or get hurt if you deadlift with terrible form. Right. I am saying, it may be more likely. Right. You may have, or even if you don't have any disc herniation or structural change in that, which again is absolutely possible, you will very likely start to get hypertonic paraspinal muscles, lower back muscles that don't want to turn off yeah. because they're conditioned to being positionally short. That will very, very likely and very, very often lead to, at the very least, reduced mobility, flexibility. Let's show positionally short. So this paraspinal comes forward on both sides. Yep. And this rib cage is going to come down in the back. Everything mm -hmm. is being tightened right through here. Yep. If you guys actually see my low back, you'll see there you the go. muscle tone there. It's a pair of pillars. So as this pelvis comes up in the back, because it's tilting down in front, and this, these ribs come down because everything is extending, everything is tightening through the back. Yep. For and that will disengage the hamstrings very quickly. Almost immediately. Position will very, very often dictate tension. Most of the time, it should. So, as how, how would an individual look? What would they look like when they walk? And are they ever using their heels to heel stretch? Oh, no. no. Again, we kind of touched base on it before. They're going to walk, move, and run like minotaurs. Everything's forward. The head's going to be way forward when they run. They're never going to get everything stacked at a, at a, at a midfoot strike uh, on the floor. Right. It's not going to happen. Right. From an anesthetic perspective, from an everyday perspective, that person will be massively inefficient in their movement. And if we start to introduce high loads to that person and high velocity, I would expect soft tissue to be absorbing far more force than it should. Mm -hmm. I would expect what I call a power leak. They're doing athletic activity, and they're producing a lot of force, but the overall outcome, overall transfer of that force is less than it should be because soft tissues are absorbing some of that force instead. Mm -hmm. And there's always this argument, well, I'm really strong, so I can't be wrong. Or I must be okay because I'm really strong. Yep. <laughs> what would you say to that? Well. First of all, survivorship bias is a real thing. And strength is cool, by the way. Yes. I'm not against strength. Everyone should get strong as hell, okay? Strength does not necessitate loss of athleticism or loss of range of motion loss of range or of loss motion. of mobility or any of the, or pain, by or the way. Or pain, true. At all. Um, for people who say, I'm uh, right because I'm strong, I don't want to go into generalizations here, but a lot of those people are on PEDs, which basically discounts everything they say for someone who's not. True. Okay? Even if you're not. Performance enhancing drugs. That's not a judgment, by the way. It is a statement of experience. It exists. Um, beyond that, just because you're strong and didn't get hurt, doesn't mean anything. Like but it's taking a small percentage of people who have managed to survive, which, by the way, that was basically the the Eastern Bloc, and I, to an extent, I believe the Chinese gymnastics. That was their uh, their methodology of picking athletes. They would put people into this grinder of a program, which broke most people, and the one that survived. <laughs> Became their athletes. You're the one. Yeah, the because one. they were just genetically resilient. Yeah, yeah. They were strong, athletic individuals that were born that way. Yeah. Cool. 
Some of us are. Most of us aren't. Right. Okay? So just because somebody else survived this way doesn't mean you will. And also, in every personal discussion I've gone into on this subject, people tell me I'm wrong, wrong, wrong. The first thing when they go to your page, or when I go to their page, is them talking about how much pain they're in. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, if you're going to argue with me that this is an optimal way to lift, but it has you constantly in pain all the time, something's not congruent there. Correct. But then again, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm right, but it's probably the case that something's off with what you're doing. Right. That's all. So, guys, it's, it, you can't have a low back and the hamstrings on maximally at the same time. That's not a question. So anytime someone says that, you can probably stop listening to most of what the rest of they have to say. Okay? So, if we go and look at the strongest men in the world, the Eddie Halls, the Hathor Bjornsons, the Magnus for Magnussons, like, literally the world's strongest men lifters. A lot of them will start off in this extended position to lift. As soon as that bar leaves the floor, their pelvis is tucked, yeah. and they're coming up. Some of them may use a, a little bit of knee extension to get there, so some quads, but most of the bulk of the work up to here is going to be hamstrings and the inferior glute max, which help tuck the pelvis, will hurt, or I'd call it the butt crack glutes. Because <laughs> that's, that's, that's where you feel. They feel kind of a stripe of glute down here that helps you tuck that pelvis. Mm -hmm. That will work with the hamstrings. Okay? So, and I remember when I used to read a lot about this mm -hmm. years ago, there was this aha moment that a lot of people had. Because back then it was all about never flex the spine. Yes, yeah. you'll, 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 you'll explode. Like, you'll, yeah, die. you'll die if you flex your spine. And then people started to point out if you look at some of these strongest men, all as they're years. coming up, you're yep. seeing them flex. Yep. No. Yeah. But of course, they are controlled, they know what they're doing. Correct. They have many men, because powerlifters peak later in life, correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. So they have so many reps and years of experience of doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. They're not a novice just flexing their spine trying to put something up. That would not be the way, what you want to do. Yes, as exactly. Of, but, but they do have an element of, of flexion mm -hmm. in that system as they're coming up. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the thing is, again, when people want to say, talk about like a straight spine. Your spine can't be straight or it's not straight. It's never going to be straight. Stop saying that. Right. Spines are not straight. Yeah. Um, You'd be in a world of hurt if you have it. It's called a Harrington rod, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. You don't really want a straight spine. That, that's a whole issue in and of itself. You'd now, be a girl of it. Neutral back, that doesn't mean anything, right? When we talk about neutrality, we're talking about the ability to get to positions. It's not a single position. Right. So a neutral back, that means nothing to me specifically. I understand what people are trying to say, somewhere between tilt, somewhere between extended, or somewhere between here and here, so somewhere in the middle. But that doesn't really give anybody a methodology or tactic to keep that position without the motion. Mm -hmm. Now, where people get a little bit confused, a little bit thrown off in my perspective and experience, People confuse some thoracic flexion, some dropping of the sternum, because you're lifting a heavy thing, with full-on lumbar flexion and looking like a dog defecating. Right? Okay. Uh, which, by the way, there's a reason to do that, because tucking a pelvis from kinks of colon. All the whole thing, right? Yeah. Now, Thank assuming you. we're not defecating while we're deadlifting, we want to keep this relatively relaxed and not involved in the process. That doesn't mean it's going to stay where it is. It means the fact that we're lifting a heavy thing will probably pull it down that does not necessitate any significant change in lumbar position. It doesn't. So a hinge, if you guys have ever seen a door hinge or anything that hinges, kind of moves around a single point. That's what our hinges should look like. We should be moving around the hips. If we want the muscles close to the hips, our hamstrings inferior glute max, obliques, TBAs, to do a lot of the heavy lifting, literally. Okay? okay. So I'm gonna demonstrate here, and again, I know this will be contentious, but I want most people to do this to not feel any low back. Okay. When we look at powerlifters, very often they have a belt. Yeah. What's the belt for? To give them a way to create intra-abdominal pressure. Right. They'll tell you the same thing. Now, they, a lot of them from training are big and extended, so they can't create their own intra-abdominal pressure. Now, they're also phenomenal athletes lifting insane superhuman levels of weight as well on top of that, right. which means they have more need to create intra-abdominal pressure. For us, I can deadlift up to 600 pounds on a trap bar closer to 700 with no belt, no wraps, no shoes, whatever. Okay. Okay? Because I can create my own intra-abdominal pressure, which is done by shortening the anterior abdominal muscles. We talk about it all the time. Your internal obliques and your transverse abdominals. Those create that IAP for you. That is spine protective, according to everyone ever. Right. I don't think anybody's in disagreement about that. So something I sometimes use, a very high technical piece of equipment, I wouldn't use them on a squat, but it's a conversation for a whole different day, but a hinge, helping someone to cue to that adduction, moving the femurs together, to 
can be very, very helpful because it's going to help inhibit the paraspinals, those low back muscles that most people love to use. I've had big, strong guys who deadlift five, six, seven hundred pounds do this with body weight and sweat and shake after 10 reps. Mm. So you're going to put that between your knees? Right between the knees. And now, now, I'm not going to keep it there forever. Okay. I'm and obviously not going to keep it there forever. Putting it between the knees will also help with the abdominals, correct? That's exactly it. So very, very simply, we're not even going to use the kettlebell for this. We'll just use the body weight for most people. I'm going to have the feet about hip width. I'm going to have the weight on the outside heels. And if I really want to get nitpicky about the feet, I want to have the base of the pinky sensing the floor, base of the big toe sensing the floor, and the pad of the big toe. So I'm not, I'm not on the outside of the heels and rolling this way. That's not very helpful. Right. Okay? So we're here, squeezing the knees. And just in this position, most people will be able to palpate their hamstrings, and the hamstrings should be on. If you squeeze a block here and have weight in the lateral heels, most people get contacted by asked about, or talked about, your hamstrings have to be on. Not a question. Right. So if you need to stand there or not, work harder, find it. Make it practice for the thing. For some people, depending, if you're wearing trash shoes, take them off. I'm not a fan of barefoot training for a lot of people for a lot of reasons, but to sense the first couple of times it can be helpful, then put good supportive sneakers back on, unless you're lifting absurd amount of weights, in which case you will ruin your sneakers fast. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately speaking from experience. All right. So, yeah, again, I'll show a front arm view as well in a moment. So light squeeze, we're gonna tuck the pelvis, and we, guys, we talked about it before, we're kind of twerking a little bit. Yep. We're going to roll this under here. That will positionally shorten these internal obliques and transverse abdominals. Upper body is a passenger in a hinge. I'm not, for powerlifting rules, we have to do a lockout. If you're not powerlifting, you don't have to do a lockout. Right. Full stop. Once the pelvis can't move any further, we don't need to move the weight any further. Um, if you were to jump, then it would be appropriate to get into that extension. Yeah. But we're, we're not doing that right now. Exactly. Yeah. There, there is a time and case for that. Absolutely. It's not today. So tuck pelvis, squeeze the block, weight to the lateral heels near the points. Upper body is a passenger, it's loose. What I'm trying to do is push the hips backward, keeping my weight on those heels, keeping the upper body relaxed and keeping the tuck. Now Neil, if you come over here and palpate my erectors, my power spinals, you'll see there's not, nothing really going on with them. Nope. They're off. These hamstrings are on. And I come back up and I tuck the pelvis. That's as far up as I'll go, not here. My pelvis is fully extended here. That's it. Now, if you have a bar, you're going to feel like a hunchback when you finish if you're used to getting to full, to full lockout from a powerlifting perspective. But if we're looking to develop hamstrings and inferior glute max or the ability to absorb force in athletic capacity, this is much more helpful. If you're lifting a lot of weight, I would come to here and inhibit the hamstrings as we shorten the paraspinals, it's going to be very difficult to safely transition back loading the hamstrings because there is that point where it has to switch from one to the other. Mm -hmm. That's, in my opinion, where a lot of the risk lies. Okay. So here, pushing back. For most people doing this, they will feel that butt crack glute. And reach around and grab the inside of your butt cheek. You will feel the butt crack glute if you do this well. Most people have never sensed that under load. Now, we introduce weight, okay? And again, you guys are gonna see significant upper thoracic flexion. You're not gonna see me round out like this and try and crunch down. The abdominal pressure is managed via the tuck. Mm. It's a lot less work than it seems. And the adductor. Yeah. Yes, the adductors, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Right. The adductors, without internal rotation of the femurs, you can't really get your pelvis into a position where nope. the abdominals can help stabilize everything. So yep. all of the, these adductors, the hamstrings, are all working to inhibit the paraspinal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hamstrings, adductors, obliques, best friends. Yeah. Quads, calves, Low back, best friends. Yeah. Okay? So same thing. We have this pretty close to us, not way out here. Pelvis is tucked. And you guys will see my hips translate backward. If you're someone, by the way, who can't touch the toes, this is a beautiful exercise. You might, you're not going to be able to get the whole way down. You might have to start up here just body weight. But if you exhale, get the position and do this, and learn how to actually translate the femurs and hips backwards while keeping a tuck, you will get your toes within a day, easily. If you do, great job, within five minutes. I've seen it happen, I don't know how many times. People are here. Yeah. Easy. Easy as that. Most people can't touch the toes, not because they have hamstring tightness, because they can't appropriately shorten a hamstring and manage internal pressure enough to push it backwards, to allow them to touch the toes. Right. They're in an ungrounded state. That's, from a neurological perspective, absolutely there. They don't know where the ground is. He's putting himself into a grounded state. Yep. So here, 
up and tuck. Now there's no butt squeeze at the top. Your butt may positionally squeeze, but we're not trying to squeeze cheeks here. Right. Okay? Because pelvis, up we kill like so. Very simple. Obviously, when you put it down, do not put it down on your toes. <laughs> now, when you when you are you trying to bring the weight forward as it goes down? I am trying to keep up? that weight as close to my body as physically possible. The only reason I pull it forward here is when I'm letting it go, so it doesn't land on my toes. Okay. If I have a barbell, it's even safer again. And it's also typically be a little bit higher. If you have a barbell and you're not comfortable with full range of motion, put plates underneath there and build it up. Or start off with a dumbbell from the top. Right. Take it easy. Do not go and try your max this way. Don't go, you know what, I haven't done this in a while. Let me max out on a brand new technique. That would be a very bad idea. Okay, w would you uh, maybe put in, again, rib cage expansion was a big thing. Oh yeah. So maybe for, for warm up with some sort of anything. Oh, I would, breathing look, I would look some hook line breathing and 1990 and even some bridges where we're tucking the pelvis, squeezing a block. And coming the whole way up, but not extending, not only extending. as far up as we can keep that tucked pelvis. I have oh, I've been seeing something where people are doing some sort of bridging, but they are purposely arching their back a little bit, and I don't understand. Personally, I don't understand the reasoning for it. I have, asked, you know people, I have asked people about this, and I have never come up with a. They never come up with a, a good cogent response. They typically said things like, "Well, I'm going through a full range of motion," I'm like, "Well." You did, and then you changed it to an entirely different range of motion that's actually antithetical to the one you were doing. Yeah, because they're they're using two feet and two hips at the same time, which yeah. again is is not normal human movement. No. In a sense of one side doing one thing and the other side doing the other. Right. So I can't understand how they're doing that without putting them back into an extension. Well, it does. State. It puts them immediately back into extension. Yeah, they're going. Okay, so yeah, that's being nice. Yes, yeah. they're going very, back into extension. You're being very generous. What they're doing is completely and utterly counterproductive to their goal. Yeah. It is also taking tension off of the muscles traditionally that they're trying to develop. Right. We're trying to get hamstrings and adductors and glutes, and now you're extending your back, and now mm -hmm. you're turning on those paraspinals again. Correct. Which doesn't make a ton of sense also, from our perspective. 